at Afros, our dream is to unlock the potential of young South Africans, young Africans across the continent. And we do this through play, through games, through digital interact interactive media that we believe can actually change the belief systems and mental models that are entrenched in our young people. So we were challenged, come here, talk about leapfrogging Africa. We believe that reimagination, being able to reimagine Africa, can change the destiny of Africa. And so what we've been doing at Afros is exploring how we can create a movement of reimaginers. Um, and there's good news, as you heard from our speaker earlier. Africa is rising. We're now considered the most hopeful continent, which is very interesting because as you walk around the African continent, you don't necessarily see hope all the time. But there is hope, and we are seeing progress. And I think a lot of that is engulfed in our, our visions, our vision documents. Um, I, I, I chose the, the Kenyan one, partly because I'm born Kenyan, but also because they've created such beautiful and fantastic images of what Kenya could look like by 2030. Um, and, you know, amongst other things, there is a dream to take a desert area of Kenya and turn that into Silicon Savannah, which will be this really sophisticated uh, new city that's focusing on technology. So the dreams are there, and we have the vision um, and, and the dreams to be able to take us to where we want to go. But we also know that there's been huge efforts from around the world. I've spent many, many years working for the UN and for development agencies and so on. Um, and I always wondered and asked myself, why is it that despite all the efforts, 560 billion is what is recorded from formal development assistance. This is not other additional NGOs, this is not foundations, this is just formal development assistance. 560 billion has been invested in Africa since the 60s. Now, I don't know how many of you would raise your hand if I ask, how many of you believe that the 560 billion is worth the results that we see? Who would put their hand up? Exactly my point. And so, 50 years post-development, we still see these sites. We still see um, communities that are not where they could be. And I believe that the main reason why is not because we lack the resources. It's not because we don't have the money or the ability to do this, but it is that we are limited by our own beliefs. Um, and so in many of our communities, and I don't know, we've been conducting lots of research in my times in the UN, we spent a lot of time with different communities, and what struck me all the time was that there was a sense that, you know, I'm stuck. For many people, I'm stuck. This is it. This is where my life starts and ends. Um, and the ability to imagine getting out of that situation is really limited to a very, very small percentage, two, three, four, five percent. And we get to hear those stories, and somehow there is something in them that is so strong that enables them to be able to just sort of step out and, and leapfrog out of that context. Um, and then there is our young people, many of them despondent today, we did extensive research uh, a, few, a couple of years ago with African Leadership Academy with a bunch of students who went traveling around the continent, and they came back with some very interesting results. They found that 50, I think it was close to 50 to 60 percent of the young people they interviewed are all eager to leave the continent the minute that they get a chance, and that their, their dream of possible prosperity comes only if they're able to exit the continent. But then you saw that beautiful picture, Africa's Rising. We talk about, you know, many of us here are looking at this beautiful Soweto theater and thinking, come on, there's real possibilities. So what really is limiting us? We believe that it is these limiting beliefs, it's our mental models that are creating this. So if you look at our chiefs, our politicians, our leaders, and it's not all of them, but a large number of them, are caught up in patronage. I mean, in the UN, you know, the person who succeeded the most, I worked there for many years, is the one who's able to suck up the best. You know, patronage is big. Parochialism, you know, it's my little world. If I can find a way to make sure that my little village and my little world gets, it succeeds, it's cool. Short-term thinking, right? Mangaun is upon us. Need I say more? <laughs> um, let's look at our public services. I was a public servant myself, so I'm totally guilty of this. We 
every single year regurgitated development plans and plans for that year. In fact, we actually sometimes just used find and replace, you know, in the, uh, uh, in the computer <laughs> to be able to sort of quickly just hook it up because these guys are demanding, give me the plan, give me the plan, give me the plan. Um, and you know, you know, the famous quote, the definition of insanity is do the same things over and over again and expect different results. Well, um, I believe that our public service organizations have huge potential in our, con our continent, but they're limited again by the belief that it is not possible to reach a prosperity. And actually, when I was at the UN, we did a very big uh, research with, with our colleagues to try to find out whether there were any of our own colleagues who believed that we would see the end of poverty in our lifetime. And there was about, uh, I think, a handful. All of them said, ah, you know, we're trying with the MDGs, but it, it's almost impossible. So these are limiting beliefs. And so what we at Afros began to explore is, how, how, do we, how do we move from that place of limiting beliefs to a place where we can recognize that our circumstances do not define our future, but that we can overcome that if we're able to th begin to think differently about that context? And how do we shape that? How do we influence that? And I know many of you have thought these thoughts, but it's how do you actually make that happen? So, we began on a very precarious journey, you know. Traveling around Africa is not an easy um, story. It's getting better, but you know. We went on a very precarious journey trying to figure out what are the possible platforms that we could use. What are the different ways in which we could shape mindsets across the African continent? Um, and as we embarked on this journey, our big thing was, if we're going to be able to make a difference, we're going to have to find something that is scalable, something that is multimedia, that can reach masses, and, and, and a way in which we can actually um, uh, change the way people think about their context. And so we focused very much on mental models. We did deep research about mental models, and we looked at the hopelessness that we talked about on the one side, the apathy, the despondency, the powerlessness, the ignorance that we see in so many of those that I've just described before, and then how we could actually move to a culture of problem solving. And I think, for me, that's a really big gap that we find, is that very often, confronted by different situations, we don't have a strong culture of problem solving. You know, I mean, it struck me, living in the US for, for quite a bit of time, how they automatically thinking about how, how, we could, how, how could we hook this up? How, how could we solve this problem? For many of us, we're waiting. It's a waiting game. Government, somebody's going to do it, you know? So how do we entrench? How do we begin to create a culture? You know, and remember, all of you who are here have brought yourselves here. So you are not anything like what I'm describing. You are the early adapters. You're the ones who care about new ideas, you know? So how do we make you become the standard who care about new ideas? Um, and so we want to create an entrepreneurial mindset. You know, our leaders need to be entrepreneurial. Rather than regurgitating those plans that we did year after year after year, how do we actually create an entrepreneurial public service, an innovative public service, a mindset that is going to be able to do this? And so we began to look at how experiential learning and simulation and games can actually um, influence mindsets and mental models. We decided to focus on three main mindsets, hope, possibility, prosperity. Could we get young Africans, young South Africans, who believe that they're stuck in poverty, to begin to imagine the possibility of, in their lifetime, being prosperous? And whatever prosperous means, it's being educated, it's having the skills, having the resources, having the whole combination of what prosperity means. What about possibility? What if I was to want to go to the moon? You know, Mark Shuttleworth story, or something, something crazier. Is it possible? And then what about hope? Is it possible for us to imagine a life beyond HIV, beyond all these other things that limit us? So this is what we chose to do. We looked at media, and we were amazed that at that time, I actually was convinced that radio was much more powerful, only to learn that actually mobile has surpassed radio. Um, and in fact, this is from 2004 and it's actually increased even more since then. And so, mobile had to be the way to go. Um, there's no question about it. The mobile revolution is a, is, a, is, a, is a revolution for Africa, and I don't need to repeat the numbers. I think you know the story. But I think what struck me about these numbers was that 
Of the 700-odd million Africans who have mobile phones, 450 million of those are under the age of 20, I think it's 28. In South Africa alone, there are 29 million youth with access to mobile. The latest uh, data that's emerging in the last month is saying that there's 100% penetration of mobile amongst young South Africans. Which means that if you travel around the continent, obviously you'll find gaps here and there, but if you travel around South Africa, you will find that any young South African has access to a mobile phone. However they have access to it, they have access to a mobile phone. We did some interesting research in Kenya, uh, in the, a rural school in Kenya uh, about three, four years ago, and we asked the, 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 the people in the room, you know, the students, we said to them, so how many of you have mobile phones? Virtually none of them put up their phones. How many of you have access to mobile phones? All of them put their, phone, their hands up, and I said, well, so what's up? How do you have access? And they dug deep into their pockets and whipped out these little SIM cards. They even had little woolen things, little packs for them. They basically walk around with SIM cards, they go to their aunt, their grandmother, the local shopkeeper, whoever has a cell phone, put in their phone and they're able to then access it that way. I mean, it's a revolution, which means that today, if we choose to, we can send key messages to every single young South African each day, it's possible to do at a time. Imagine the power of influence that is possible with that. And so we began to focus our attention of young people, how we could create them as the next custodians of Africa's future. And, you know, I'm a mother. I'm a mother of three children. You need to add that to my CV. I'm a mother of three children. <laughs> it's probably my greatest achievement. But, um, and I observed them, and like many mothers, and fathers, you fight with your children, get off that game, stop playing, you know, my son is on FIFA all the time, so we're always having this battle about games. And then I started noticing the strategic thinking that was going on as he was making choices. And he said to me, Mom, come over here, watch me. I'm playing this game and it even has African leaders, because he knows my fetish about this. And he says, look, there's Shara Zulu and there's Mandela and there's all these people in there. Relax, 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 I'm learning stuff, you know. I even know about Mansa Musa from uh, the Empire of Mali and Songhai. Who else knows that? And I know that from a game. So I was like, okay, let me pay attention. And so I paid attention. And then I started doing this research and I, and I, and I learned this. I found that there's, you know, very clever people all over the world who are actually using games and simulations to change the world. There's a whole community called Games for Change, and, you know, out there. I didn't, I, you know, so I thought, okay, so I'm not that crazy. But actually, this is where I got my aha, just paying attention and watching what my children did, were doing. And so I began to think, imagine this, we want to influence mental models, we want to be able to shift the, the belief systems of young people, and 55% of them play games every day. You might not want them to, but they do. So how do we actually put stuff in there that's going to change the way that they do things? And so we began to imagine. Imagine if you have this young, young girl in front of a, of, of a game, and she's able to create a new enterprise. She's able to create, through the game, you know, a new community. You know, and look at all the factors that are required to be able to build that. Imagine what that could look like. And she's having fun. So let me illustrate how we've actually done this. We had a partnership with the United Nations Women, or we have a partnership with the United Nations Women, who had a big campaign on, uh, to end uh, gender violence across the African continent. So they approached us and asked us whether we could focus on a product that would be just, you know, focusing on young people. And so we went out and we spent time with the young people doing research and really trying to explore what it is they need to... Um, how they understand gender violence. I mean, we learned that date rape is so rife that it is nothing that the data ever gathers. That the concept of consenting sex is totally misunderstood. And so we decided to focus and build this game, Muraba, which is really an uh, extrapolation of Muraba Raba, the game that you're familiar with, um, which we then incorporated 60 questions, so it's a quiz-based game, um, that w embedded in it gender-based violence questions that are related to what are the concepts of gender violence, what do you do in the event that you're confronted by gender violence, you know, what are the stereotypes and myths that are, that are limiting um, and, 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 and you know, driving gender-based violence. And so Muraba has been out there, we launched it in February of this year. These teenagers are testing their knowledge of what's right and wrong when it comes to sexual relationships. A girl is in bed with you but says she doesn't want sex. You must respect her choice. No, sometimes means yes, you must kick her out. 
The questions pop up during a game called Moraba. The more answers they get right, the further they advance. It's an app that makes learning fun. They all stay after school to play. Their newfound knowledge is empowering. I can tell the guy that I'm not ready to have sex with you. And if you don't accept that, take away and I'll take my hand. I'm not ready. As I have played even the games of Moraba Raba, it taught me like every person, girl and a guy, we are all equal. It's not always that boys are the ones who like like force girls to do stuff. Even girls are there that do stuff to, go, to guys as well. The app is aimed at addressing South Africa's high levels of gender-based violence. The issue was highlighted earlier this year when seven young men, four of whom were minors, gang raped a 17-year-old mentally ill teenager. It's cases like that which prompted the game's developer to come up with a way of educating young people through entertaining them with mobile technology. The idea was hatched at this... It's a long story, so I didn't want to, to pull, push the whole video, but... So that's the story, and that's how the game works. This is just a simple illustration of exactly how we've made this game. Um, measuring impact for us was very important, and so we've built the game with a, a, a back-end system that enables us to actually measure the learning. And so every time a player gets on and plays the game, we're able to go into the back-end. We don't need to know their personal identities, so the focus really is on, and you know, they use all kinds of names like chili beef and other names that they create, but the important thing is what, how they're answering the questions. And you're able to see the trends. Um, and, you know, so for instance, we, we, we found out that the knowledge of legal age of sex, how many of you know the legal, legal age of sex in South Africa? 16? Do you think so? 25 years old. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right, 16 is right. But what we found very interesting was that the knowledge is very, very mixed. Mm? So amongst young people, they were saying, for instance, that if I'm a 17-year-old boy, you know, I'm the legal age, and if I have sex with a 15-year-old girl who consents, it's cool, right? And so we needed to correct a lot of that. And we found that they just didn't understand a lot of this. And so we you know, were able to measure that and we're able to also measure how and encourage them to play. And so we, we built in some rewards, some airtime rewards and so on, so that they can come back in and play a few times. Sorry for using bribery, but sometimes it works. And so we got them to play a second, a third time. And what we noticed was that repeated play actually improves the learning. So you can see that they actually, now they'll know and they'll have a chance to actually improve their response as they play the game. This is just, uh, uh, you know, we have them sort of make comments um, offline about the game and this is just uh, one of the millions of testimonies that we've gathered over time. I think the most powerful one of all is a young man who approached us and said, until I played Moraba, I did not know that I was a rapist. He today has taken a decision that he will not engage in anything like that that would put him into that context. He has changed his mental model. It is something that um, we're very proud of and we're working hard now to execute and implement in the other games that we're working on. This is a game that we've built in Kenya. Haki means uh, rights or justice in Kiswahili. And um, it's about reimagining sustainable communities. We've had many big landlords and big politicians who've come in and sort of tried to take over uh, huge forests and, and, and uh, influence the land uh, negatively, and so we built this game really in honor of Wangari, Professor Wangari Mathai. Um, we built another game in partnership with the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund, focusing on child protection and children's rights during the World Cup. Um, and we found that young people who, young children who, prior to playing the game, did not even know about Childline, learned about the Childline and learned what the Childline number was, and so we saw an increase in uh, access to Childline. So small, small um, uh, measurements and small ways to actually uh, measure the impact, but um, we found that we're able to do that. We're working now on a game which is really quite a challenge in Kenya. Um, after the elections in 2007, there was a huge blow up of the country, as you know, and Kenya was burning. And so we're, we're working with young people now to see whether or not through this game we can get them to really contemplate the choices that they're making during the game, whether or, I mean during the elections, whether or not they're bribed by our cheap politicians to go ahead and burn, you know, take the bribe and don't burn, you know, recognize how the choice that you make, <laughs> recognize that the choice that you make affects the collective. Mm? So this is what we're, the whole purpose of this objective of this game. Um, and so we've, we've built four, four games now. We're, 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 you know, we're, we're working on three or four at, at, the, at the moment and we're, we're planning to increase that, triple that in the next year. But I think the key thing that we've learned from the games 
is that, you know, and this is, I think, our theory of change, is that what the way in which the games influence and, and change mental models is, in the first instance, when you start playing Muraba, you probably have never really thought about whether rape or date rape affects you. So it's pre-contemplation, you haven't even thought about it. So that's where you start from. But it's a fun game, so you get into it, and because it's, you know, it's fun and cool, let me try this thing. So you play, and as you play, you're forced to contemplate those issues because you have to answer the questions. And you know, in games, people want to do well. They want great points. They want to win. They want rewards. So you got to win, you know, so do well. And in the process, you contemplate. Will I rape? Would I, am I, am I a date raper? Could I be? Will I be violent? Will I make that choice? You know, so you contemplate. Um, when you contemplate, you have to make a choice in the game. Is it right? Is it wrong? And that's a decision that you take. And we found that as, as, as the users play, make those decisions, those decisions are replicated in their real lives, for many of them. Obviously, it's not that simple, but we noticed as they played a second time, a third time, and for those who we conducted deep research with, that they actually changed their, their, their decisions in line with the choices in the game. So they make a decision, and that emerges with new choices, and, th and therefore, new mental models. So it's a very simple model, but it's something that we believe is, is, is strengthening our, our way ahead. And so, moving forward, we are now taking our experience from the games that we've built, and we're building what we're calling the Ongoza Gamified uh, Academy. The Ongoza, Ongoza means, uh, in Kiswahili means to lead, so it's like a leadership academy. Um, and it's basically going to be on mobile, where you know, you've got the games in the, in the, on the mobile phone, it's accessible, it's, it's got mass reach. And our key themes would be leadership, entrepreneurship, financial stewardship, citizen agency, and life skills. So our plan with Ongoza is that we can reach the entire continent, and this is our intention, is to be able to have it in all the different languages and have it spread around the continent. It needs to be accessible, it needs to be affordable, and we believe that we'll be able to, to really leapfrog the future using this, this, this approach. One last word, um, and it's about scale and impact. We have been having very interesting debates about how many people do we actually try to reach. Like with Muraba, do we want two million? Do we want three million? How many should we reach? How, many, how much is good enough? And so we began to study this whole law of diffusion of innovation and of ideas. And we learned that 2.5% are the early adapters. So you guys, you know, you fit comfortably with that 2.5%. But that if you really want to have your product out there and reach the millions, more importantly, if you want to leapfrog that impact, you will need to reach the tipping point. And the tipping point is estimated between 15 to 18%. So if we want to reach that young South African and be able to actually move this so that it becomes, you know, viral, we need to reach that first 4.6 million. And so that becomes the target that we're trying to reach in each one of the, of the countries and the nations that we're working in. Um, and finally, you know, South Africa's vision is great, and all our countries have these big visions that we're working on. But it's, it's up to us. Trevor Manuel has put it out there. It's not his business anymore. It's up to us to figure it out. And so what we at Afros are doing is doing our best to see how we can help to shift and mold and shape new mindsets amongst who we believe are the future generation of Africa who can actually turn this continent around. We believe it's possible, and we believe as we have worked through with a whole group of young people, that they can actually change the world and leapfrog the future for Africa. I thank you. 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 Thank